welcome back to Think Tech. This is Coronaville, what's next on a given 30, a Thursday. And um, now before we start, a few words from our friend Sylvia. Welcome to Coronaville, what's next, which plays on Think Tech Hawaii every Thursday at 11 a.m. Today, one week after the inauguration, we will talk about how hard President Biden is working on COVID and how well he and his team are doing. Jay Fidel is our host, and our guests are Tim R. Pichella, Cynthia Lee Sinclair, Stephanie Dalton, and Winston Welch. Our panel will discuss President Biden's team, the status of his COVID relief bill in Congress, his attempts to require masks and social distancing, his efforts to get more vaccine, the numbers of vaccinations so far, the shortages and supply line issues, the timeline to vaccinate the country, the threat presented by the variants, the disparity among the states, and how well we are doing as against Europe and Asia. Our plate is certainly full today. In any event, we and the new administration have found that dealing with the pandemic is and will be very challenging. Okay, <clears throat> that said, Tim, how well is Joe Biden doing? How well is his team doing? one week after inauguration on COVID? Well, I think the operative point you just made was one week. Uh, look at the Trump administration with 10 months at the helm and how little they did. And Joe Biden in one week has moved the ball forward down the field exponentially faster. And so I think he's doing an outstanding job. I, I was a little concerned that um, he increased the projection of vaccinations to be injected into people's arms um, and really not having to handle, I, I think, on the production schedule. Uh, so that's kind of betting on the come, as they say. But um, I think he'll, he'll accomplish it. I think he'll hit his target goal and uh, we will get these vaccinations in hand. And I think they'll do what they have to do uh, regarding the variant virus and they'll have to adjust and and move their strategies uh, one way or the other to deal with that as well. But I think he's doing an excellent, excellent job and his administration that's tasked with that are also doing an excellent job. Now, what about, uh, what about the bill, the COVID relief bill in Congress? Um, sounds like that's, uh, that's an important bill, really important. Um, is that gonna get through? Are we gonna have trouble with the Republicans? And, and what can Schumer do to make sure it gets through? Despite rhetoric of, um, unity and cooperation with Mitch McConnell and the other GOP senators, uh, that only goes so far. I think they're at a point now where if you're, if you're in the way and you don't wanna work with the new administration for one reason or another, maybe you think they're not uh, justified to be there in the first place, um, they're gonna push them aside. And they'll, they'll get the COVID stimulus uh, taken care of via the budgetary uh, resolution process. They're not gonna wait around, they're not gonna stall, and they're not like a Mitch McConnell and his ilk um, delay the game. Give us a moment on the budgetary process. Okay, well, see, I think if, if things don't move along, uh, they're going to they're gonna move it within a week from now. How do and they do just, that? How does the budgetary process give them an advantage they wouldn't otherwise have? Well, it's the votes. It's, you know, you, you don't need a super majority for a budget of uh, votes. You need 51 votes. And Kamala Harris will be the 51st vote. So that's yeah. how they're going to do it. Uh, um, I don't think they want to play hardball so early in the new administration, but I think they will if they have to. And, you know, Mitch McConnell has kind of thrown some, um, you know, some diversionary tactics in the water. And I, I think that only goes so far now. Um, the diversionary, diversionary tactic I'm referring to is the impeachment trial, where Mitch McConnell was all, you know, said on the Senate floor, floor how guilty Donald Trump was of inciting the attack on the Capitol, and then uh, said he doesn't want to entertain the trial until Donald Trump is out of office. Now that Donald Trump's out of office, he doesn't want to entertain the trial. So what kind of political shenanigans was that? And I think that really uh, set the tone uh, in the wrong direction for Mitch McConnell and the other GOP senators, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Cynthia, how are we doing on COVID? You know, um, I've heard most recently that the numbers are a little better, but do you have any idea about where we're going on this? They're still super, super high. It's not really so much that they're better, but it's that they're kind of starting to go on a downturn. 
a little bit, but we're still just astronomical. Uh, worldwide cases, 101,068,455. Uh, deaths, 2,180,021. In the US, our cases are 25,620,883. And our deaths are almost 430,000. Our, our worst days, our deadliest months of the, of the year, I mean, of this whole time, here in the US anyway. Uh, in April, we had 60,000 deaths. In December, 77,000 deaths. And in January, 81,477 deaths in one month, just in the month of January, which we are not even totally out of yet. And we're having, you know, three, 4,000 a day. So, you know, let's get it local. Here in Hawaii, we've got, we've had 25,442 cases and we've had 404 deaths. Now that, um, that death rate went up, jumped markedly just recently. And it was because they were um, entering in some backdated cases that had not originally been um, contributed to COVID. So we've had here in Hawaii, 109,808 vaccinations administered. Um, all totaled in the United States, we have 47,230, Wait, 230,000, sorry, 950 distributed and administered. We have only 24, less than half almost, or about half, 24,652. Wait a minute. I, I totally got those wrong. 47,230,950. I totally butchered that first one. Sorry. That was distributed. Now administered is 24,652,634. The states that are, that are doing well, that have the highest numbers of administered doses is Texas, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and New York. There are 16 states that have less than 50% of their doses delivered, that were delivered, that have been administered. And one new quick thing is that they finally found the South African variant and it was in South Carolina. It has arrived and it was with somebody who had not traveled out of the country yet. Um, so it, they were exposed by someone here. So it's already here. We know it's in the United States. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, don't, um, don't be limited to the, um, what is it? The one that most recently popped up, as uh, Cynthia mentioned. In fact, there are three variants, right, Stephanie? And there are 500 cases around the country in one or the other of those variants. So what does that mean? What does the variant mean? Is it of concern? Stephanie, are you stopping me? Stephanie. Oh, oh, of oh, oh, huge concern. <laughs> yes, because it's East Coast now and West Coast. So, I mean, I, I was planning to go back in another month. And I, I mean, seriously, if that's starting to go around, uh, I will rethink this. But um, one, one um, precaution and one hopeful piece of uh, uh, remembering is that the same kind of vaccine as they're using in that wonderful piece you sent around, Jay, about uh, the for the D, the RNA based uh, vaccines. Those those that is the technique that's used to to take care of Ebola, and that's why we don't we didn't get more than one case or two cases in of Ebola in this nation. So we keep forgetting that we've already done this and snuffed it from the get-go with the same kind of technique we're using now for, for this virus. And I mean, why, why this has taken so long to get us uh, in, the, in the groove here on the tech, the scientific uh, vaccine that, that works is, is beyond me. But anyway. Well, let me ask you more about this. You know, the, the thing about the, uh, the variant is that the more cases, 
the, <clears throat> the virus mutates, okay? All viruses mutate. This one is no exception. The original uh, coronavirus mutates. <clears throat> the more cases of coronavirus you have out there, thanks to Dr. Trump, okay, the more mutation you have. And the more mutation you have is the more the random possibility that it will mutate in a way that's more detrimental to humanity, yeah. which is exactly what has happened. Exactly. If we had snuffed the original coronavirus early, uh -huh. we wouldn't have the variants. It'd be a real long shot. But now we have all these cases and we have three variants that we know of. There might be more variants. Well, it's more. Yeah, I mean, it's going like crazy. And that's why I think that that would be the secret put urge behind getting all these vaccines out because we've now reached critical. Okay, I don't know what they would have called it on the Starship Enterprise, but we're at where those sirens, those bells are ringing because these suckers are about to come together and uh, we could be looking at a big wipeout here. So, uh, but but we're we are armed. And many of us now are already protected to a degree. So, but but this is not a good situation. I mean, Biden truly is correct. This is a war zone. I mean, we are on the edge. And that anybody is thinking about anything else and not about our survival is really scary for us as a nation. So um, that's kind of like not the good news today, but the good news actually is with having to do with your previous questions, Jay, is that Schumer is going right ahead, bravely, courageously trying to get this uh, COVID, next COVID bill uh, done so that um, they're gonna actually do it by votes. He wants to just do, put it through by 51. And he says he thinks he can do that according to the items, that, the, the articles I've read. And so that's critical to the COVID because there's the money for the states. The states are, are really stripped down on their budgets for handling all of this delivery system. So um, that that has to go. And so I'm just really very um, uh, you know, excited about the way Schumer, in addition to Biden, but Schumer now is really acting out. He's pushing up against the Republican resistance, reluctance, whatever they have going on with them. So if we've got the 51 votes and it can go on, go bipartisan is much less important than yeah we need the money but i'd like to add that uh, i i got a shot last week a week ago and um was with uh, hph and was with uh, in the pier one or pier two over there and uh, <clears throat> they they also took my wife who is not not in the first tier but she was my my accompanying person and we both got shots and they were as sweet as they could be it was the aloha spirit all over the place and they were efficient and sweet. The whole experience was positive. However, a buddy of mine who was going to go down with his wife yesterday, his wife was rejected because she was not in tier one. And, and that is part of the, the change in policy that happened in the interim, namely that they don't have a lot of, they don't have enough. Mm -hmm. And so they're cutting off the accompanying person now. So it's a little tighter. And you can only hope that uh, the Pfizer, there's enough Pfizer around to handle the second shot. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, what is, where does that leave us, Winston? <clears throat> you know, we, we, we got to worry about this. Uh, these these um, vaccines don't kick in immediately. Some of them may not be as effective uh, against the variants. The variants are spreading. I think there's more, more than 500 in the country, you know, probably understated. Um, all governments have a way of understating cases, including as a scandal going on about Andrew Cuomo and the people who died in senior facilities today. So what do we do? What does the average person do if he's not in tier one or she's not in tier one uh, right now? What, what, what's, what's the mindset? What's the action? Give some advice, would you, Winston? Same thing that I've been spouting the whole year, Mr. Fidel, which is exercise individual responsibility and don't be a sociopath. When you go outside in public, we don't have a problem with this in Hawaii. I mean, you, no, no Karens here that I've heard of, but you know, every, or the male versions, right? but or if they do, I, I, it's, we wear masks here. Now CDC is telling us we're double masks. So they say, put the, the more protective one closer to your face. So if you start feeling faint, 
uh, for not enough uh, air getting in, uh, which there hopefully is, uh, you put your cotton mask on top and then the, uh, uh, the, the more medical mask underneath. But essentially it says we should all be wearing N95s or KN95s or something along those lines. Uh, the Germans have, have moved to that standard and said, if you're going out in public, you have to be wearing these masks now. Uh, of course, there's underreporting. COVID's never going away, Jay. That's the bad news. Um, it's always going to be with us. Some variant of it is going to be with us, like the flu. Um, and I, unless I, I just don't see it happening. However, Dr. Fauci did say, as these new variants pop up, they will also create different vaccines to attack them as necessary. So uh, they were able to pull this off in a year. Um, we'll have to wait and see what's coming up, but some of them look uh, pretty uh, scary. You know, the the Brazilian one in uh, Manaus is, seems to have completely reinfected the population, or something's going on down there that we that that I'm not clear on. I read here, I was I heard about the British version, which is more lethal and more infectious, and uh, the South African one and the Brazilian one. But then I read, maybe it was yesterday, the Danish variant was here and found in Hawaii. Did you read that? Uh, uh, and, and so there are dozens of variants that they're certainly tracking out there, and uh, we'll just have to see which ones pop up. But in the meantime, you mask up, you wash your hands, you don't go out if you don't have to. Um, if, you're, if you're getting your shots, continue getting your shots. They're coming out. Johnson Johnson's coming out, AstraZeneca. There's a, uh, other ones on the horizon. We will all be vaccinated within a short period of time or have reasonable herd immunity. So you know, you know, Winston, there was a piece that I that I caught recently about how in Europe they had seen the variant and acted on it. And they have researchers who are working on, you know, up, what do you want to call it, updating uh, the mRNA, whatever technique, to deal with the variant. And, and it shouldn't be all that complicated, but they were working on it. Unfortunately, in the last days of the Trump administration, they didn't do anything about the variant. They didn't um, do anything about anything. So, yeah, don't. Let's so we, we're we're that. playing catch up. We're Our researchers catch up. are playing catch up now on the variant. This is not. This is not a good thing. No, and there's something that there's something they know that we don't know. Um, when the U.S. came out with something that said, "If you leave the country, just be prepared because you may not be able to come back." Um, as soon as you think you might be able to. That came out yesterday from the, uh, I think it was the State Department. And Israel has completely shut off all air traffic in and out of the country. So they're, they're realizing this is what we, they have to do to protect themselves. And they're, they're the gold standard as far as immunization goes. And so they're realizing, uh, let's just wait and see. So we've got, we've got a lot of pain coming up in the next few weeks and couple months, but we will get beyond it and take care of yourself and take care of others. And that's the only message that we can continue to have until we reach some herd immunity and, and serious levels of vaccination. Well, Tim, a lot of this suggests we had to look at the timeline. We have various things going on here. We have the, the new energy in the Biden administration, that team, it's a good team. They're doing everything they can. They recognize the severity of the epidemic, pandemic, um, and they're doing stuff that you know that we would do. I mean, that rational science people would do, uh, as opposed to the previous administration, whose name shall be erased. Um, but but my concern, my, my, my question to you is, uh, how long is it going to take before you get a handle on this? You still have the infection going on. It, it may have a dip right now, but complacency uh, will probably increase it. And I worry about complacency and I worry about the variant. So we really, you know, what's your thought about how long it's gonna take? And the main question I'm really asking is, what about the economy, man? You, you know, you can send money out to people, but we still have to rebuild the economy. How much time can we wait while we're dealing with this pandemic um, before the economy really goes in the drink. Got any thoughts about that? Uh, two thoughts, because you asked me two questions. And that is, I, I, I'm actually a little bit optimistic because uh, it wasn't long ago that there were uh, those that were very hesitant to taking a vaccine at all. And we're starting to see uh, statistics point that Americans are starting to accept the concept of the vaccine and, and more willing to um, to take it and, and have it you know administered. So I find that very optimistic news because 
obviously we're not going to get to herd immunity without cooperation from all the Americans we possibly can as far as accepting the vaccine. Um, but it's now that we have the introduction of variants that puts us back, you know, pushes us back a bit. And we're gonna have to, you know, figure out new uh, techniques to handle the variant. As far as the economy, well, Jay, you know, you listened to the previous administration and the, the economy was rosy um, because the economy consisted of three things, the Dow Jones, the Standard and Poor's and the NASDAQ. That was the that was the economy. And you know, I'm here to say that the economy is not the stock market. The economy is unemployment, it's gross production, national production, it's you know, it's confidence by uh, production managers, it's 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 production output. I mean, we have all these economic indicators, and yeah, they're on the weak side. Uh, but the Dow Jones, you wouldn't know that because. 1% owns 50% of the stock market. And we have 10% uh, of the Americans owning 80% of the stock market. So, you know, happy times are here again for those select few. Well, and, actually uh, the market went down a few days ago by 600 points. Yeah, well, and then, you know, and then when you're, it, uh, when you're at 30,000, six, yeah. 600 points is a drop in the bucket. Buying opportunity. You know, and that's how they, that's how we view it. So the economy is fundamentally, uh, we're in recession territory, and um, though we haven't recognized it, and, and yeah. Wall Street hasn't recognized it because, again, it's being propped up by the few and the special few, those with resources. So uh, until we start seeing drops in the Dow, then people start to open up their eyes, going, "Well, wait a minute, my 401k has been damaged. What's going on here?" where they should be saying that right now is what's going on with the economy and what can we do to um, you know, prop it up? And a big part of that is COVID's compliance. And until we get that, and we're not there yet, um, we'll continue to, continue to see our economy kind of slag and, and lag behind. You know, Cynthia, we've been trying to figure out the, uh, the, the psychological, sociological question of why people follow Trump. It's, it's like a question in everybody's mind. I talked to my friends uh, on the mainland. I mean, they're all Democrats these days, but, and I said, well, why, why, why do people follow him when he did such an obviously bad job on everything? And he's so mean and nasty, why do they follow him? And nobody has a really good answer. And, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering, as we start to recognize, as, as Tim has said, um, the severity of the, of the pandemic, as it, you know, may get worse as the stock market, which I believe it will get worse in the stock market because the, the fundamentals are the economy and the economy is not doing well at all. Um, I'm wondering if, if the people in the base are going to try to shed off Trump. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of Republicans bail out of the party, but, but not, not that many when you count, you know, 70 million people voted for him. What do you think is going to happen here? Is this going to have a, a political effect? Well, you know, there's going to be a core nugget of them that will never come back. They are lost to the cult of personality. It's very difficult to bring people back from a cult. And, you know, it's very specific. You ask the question, why? I have some answers about it. You know, you can look up the Dunning-Kruger effect where it, the, the person who's trying to manipulate someone else um, or the reason why people are going uh, and falling prey to their manipulator is, is because it speaks to something within themselves that they want to see raised up higher, right? So they can feel better about themselves because they think those same kinds of things. So there's that group of folks. And then there's, so it's not like one fell swoop that we can define them all with, right? So then there's another group that it's just the money. They don't care about anything else but the money. They got lots of money while he was in office through the stock market and other uh, perks that they received while he was there. So there's that. And then there's a whole, another group of conservative Christians who just wanted to get rid of abortion and to get their conservative judges on, you know, on the bench. So there's, I think there's different reasons why different people follow him. And some people just literally fall prey 
to the misinformation, the constant lie. It's not just one lie. It's not just a lie. First, you know, he's undermined the whole um, identity of truth, what it is, right? It no longer exists. Now it's just alternative facts. Um, and so that, so once you get rid of truth, and then you see the same lie over and over and over and over to the point where people start to believe it. And that's just common, classic narcissistic tendencies of people that are just in a regular abusive domestic violence situation, the abuser will do those exact same things. Undermine the person's ability to believe in themselves, right? And then feed them a bunch of stuff that's not true and tell them enough that they believe it. You know, there was a piece uh, that I saw this morning about how some of the social media, this is tripping off what Cynthia was saying, some of the social media organizations have not only cut off Trump, um, but they've cut off anyone who wants to um, make um, harsh political statements. I don't remember the definition. And so my question to you is, is the, are there changes among the social media companies that are going to have an effect either on um, the complacency we worry about, uh, Biden's suggestion, and he's not, he's not going hard on this. He's not seeking legislation to require masks. He's not trying to do proclamations to require masks. He's just um, he, he's, he's laying it in on federal, um, federal uh, reservations, federal buildings. And so the, the question is, uh, how, how do the changes in social media affect this pandemic going forward? That one for me, James, is that what you said? Yeah, that for you. You know, uh, it, it's a good question. And part of it is troubling. I, I noticed that the My Pillow guy got banned from Twitter forever because he said that the Donald won the election. Well, so did half the nation. And so are they all going to be banned from Twitter and Facebook? Yeah. Seems counterproductive because if that's where people are getting their messages. Now I'm all for, of course, when someone's inciting violence or insanity. And also they have a public responsibility, they have a corporate responsibility to stop things that are dangerous. So they've uh, they banned uh, you know, certain hashtags that people would look to find each other. That also has the effect of driving them underground and going to Telegram, but it makes, for, it, makes it a lot harder for them to find each other. So in that way, I think it's, um, it's not the worst thing to ban certain hashtags. As far as people, uh, maybe they need to take the tack of what they were doing with Donald Trump and saying, this has been identified as fake, um, false information. Um, but, you know, if you're reading that and you believe it, like Cynthia was saying, if, if you're programmed, it doesn't really matter what the truth is. So I think the message is we just have to keep getting out um, as true messages as much as possible, telling the truth, being trustworthy. That's one thing this administration has on its side already is it's not lying to us from the get-go, every single word isn't a lie. Every proclamation from the press secretary isn't a lie. Uh, there were, this was the smallest inauguration in the 20th century, and I think, and the, or the last century for the president. I think everyone would agree with that statement and probably Biden's press secretary could put that out and honestly say that. So you wouldn't say this was the biggest attended press, uh, you know, uh, in our, our presidential inauguration ever. So I think we're starting off in a better place to keep it on getting, getting out positive, correct news. Now, not even positive, just real news so that people can deal with reality because if they're not even getting facts and they can't understand it, we don't stand a chance because everyone thinks it's just misinformation. And so uh, yeah, tell the truth, the whole truth as much as you can um, and just keep on getting it out there. But banning, banning um, people from from Facebook or, or, or Twitter because they have um, incorrect ideas. I don't know is the most effective thing, but certainly there's things they can do to slow it down or stop it when it is indeed dangerous, like banning the hashtag altogether. Stephanie, continuing on that track, you know, already we see the signs of campaigns for 2022 and for that matter, 2024. And, um, you know, the Republicans are still together. There are certain Republicans who have left, left the party. Uh, there are news stories about how the party is uh, under pressure, may, may come apart. But, but for the moment, you know, it's still there and it still supports Trump. 
and it's still mm, it's planning on a, a big rush for 2022. And I wonder how you feel all of this that we've been talking about affects that, that election. Because remember that time is a huge factor. When um, Mitch McConnell said, let's put off the impeachment for a couple of weeks, what he was really saying, I don't think we can deny this, was uh, we know this is going to soften in a couple of weeks. The Trump's chances at that trial, Trump's political support at that trial will change in the next couple of weeks and it'll change in his favor if we put it off. I mean, he's a real smart guy. I don't wanna say how I feel about his morality, but um, you know that he did that intentionally to help Trump. And by the same token, you know, the, the fickle finger writes the news. We'll have a million things going on. And although Biden and his team would do a great job, um, the fact is we still have a problem with the pandemic and, and Congress. So query, you know, how is it playing out now if we look forward to uh, 2022? Well, I think we're up against uh, what we already know. <laughs> First of all, those who can manipulate the media are far ahead of the game and Trump and other people are, are very expert at that. And that's been going on, and especially from the Republican Party for ages, decades, and uh, going back to some of the stars we know, Newt Gingrich and all the rest of them uh, that have gotten these bad ads out to us. But the most important thing about the media and in respect for what Winston's talking about is all of this is whack-a-mole. I mean, okay, Facebook may or may not be here in uh, 24, I don't know. But the point is, if it is whack, there's gonna be five others of them someplace else. So there, it's only about the, the, the competent and brilliance of people that can manipulate that outflow that, that is going to be um, yield, yield tools for them to do what they want to do. We'd like people to do those things for good and for democracy and for our what was our value system. But let's, let's go back to something we already did do together and know so well. I mean, I'm a high school teacher. I taught at Radford High School for years, but if you will just not even worry about teaching high school and be a high school student again and remember your student body and your class. These, there are layers as Cynthia described, there's layers of people in there, exactly the same layers as are out here in the public now um, doing, doing what they're doing. So we, we have to go back and look at the population and we have to go back and, and ask why do we have more of this domestic violence? With, so what are we doing? What's Germany doing? What's Japan doing? How, how are they managing? Oh, that actually leads perfectly to my last question to Tim. Tim, you, you mentioned uh, Israel, for example, and uh, different countries take different approaches. The uh, World Health Organization is probably in better shape now that the US is going back in. Uh, hopefully the United Nations will you know, play in general a role to bring this effort together. But the fact is that Canada got cut off. It's not happy about that. Um, and the US is not helping Canada. I'm sorry about that. I'm sure Biden is sorry about it too. We have variants coming in from corners of the globe. We have huge travel issues. We have right now, we have uh, a, a protest, a series of protests around India We'll be covering that later today that actually threatens democracy in the view of some people. I mean, the, the, the pandemic seems to be mm, disrupting things in general around the world. Uh, and I, I, I know it's a big question and, and you have a minute to answer it. And the question is exactly? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, you know, how does the, the global process play out on this? Well, I think Winston actually alluded to it. And the pandemic is here to stay. We're going to have to adapt. And, and human beings do that. They either change their environment or they adapt to it. And we will, we will adapt to this ongoing COVID virus. And it will become more, I hate to use this term because that's how it was used to begin with, as a flu. It will become more like contending with a flu virus. Unfortunately, this one's more deadly and hopefully over time as it mutates, it becomes less deadly and maybe more transmissible, but less deadly. So the economies of the world, the, the, the political powers of the world will all have to adapt and, and it, every country will do it differently. 
Um, yes, Israel is the gold standard, but look at their population. It's so much easier to manage a, 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 a virulent virus when your population is much smaller than, say, India or you know China. Uh, th their populations are, are tremendously high. So we will adapt, and, and I think that's the best answer I can come up come up with at this point. Okay. Um, as uh, Sylvia said originally, we had a lot on our plate today, and we will still have a lot on our plate going forward here in Coronaville. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Winston. Uh, aloha, and please stay safe. Aloha. <laughs>